Let's bow and pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the day you give us. We thank you for your love for us that brings us to together. Lord, we thank you for the love that we can share with each other. We thank you that we can gather together to pray, to lift up needs of those that we hear about. We continue to pray for uh, Henson and Tony. Lord, the physical needs that Henson needs. Lord, the, Lord, the peace of mind. Lord, the, the strength to, to deal with, Lord, his, his cancer. And Lord, for his wife, Lord, to just continue to be her strength. Lord, to lift her up. Lord, to just abide with her and to have that peace in her heart to provide their needs. We just thank you that as we have witnessed in the past, Lord, even though we see that there are those who we, we deeply pray for, we care about, we love, but yet, nonetheless, they've walked through that, that corridor of death. Father, your will is greater than ours, but what they have learned and what they have gained is much. We ask that upon our church family as well and those that we know. Lord, we ask you to be our guide, our wisdom, in what we pray for and ask for in our church, about our church. Not just to have a, a new building to be proud of, but Father, a, a place where we can minister more effectively, to minister to our children, our kids, our youth, our adults. What a place that's accessible, what a place that's just worthy of, of who you are in answering our prayer. We come before you for that. We thank you for all that you do, and how you'll bring this about. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here again tonight. May we gain strength from your word, understanding of who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, last Sunday, I, I, I dealt in the book of Philippians, and um, one, of the, one of the little phrases that um, I had talked about was in verse 12, and it says, But I make every effort to take hold of it, and this is, again, the goal. We we're talking about goals and things of that nature. So I make every effort to take a hold of it because I've also been taken hold of Christ Jesus. You know, we strive to take hold of those things because you know, we need to be taken hold of by Jesus too. We're not going to be successful. We're not going to be happy. Uh, we'll be disappointed unless the Lord gets a hold of us. You know, our, our, I, mean, I remember growing up as a kid, um, Whenever I got in trouble, you know, if it was a family issue, um, if we got in trouble or got caught, we had the choice. Dad could spank us or mom could spank us. You know, of course, I always picked mom because, you know, I didn't like dad's whoopings, you know. Um, dad could just give you one whooping and man, yeah, that, it lasts a long time. But mom's, you know, was... I don't, I don't know if because of her heart or whatever, you know, she didn't whoop us as bad, but we know we deserved it. And whenever we got um, in trouble, you know, we knew mom or dad was going to get a hold of us. And we knew the consequences. There'd be times I'd be sitting in church, <clears throat> cutting up in church. And uh, I knew I was in trouble. Because I'd see mom, she would turn her head and just look. 
It's like I could read her mind. You, when we get home, you're getting it, you know. And I just sat there like, oh, man. I was afraid. I, I was always afraid of the day Dad would turn around and look at me, you know. <clears throat> I remember there was a young lady at church at Glorietta, pastor's daughter. She was sitting toward the back. And there was a boy that liked her, was sitting next to her, and they were kind of cutting up in church. We didn't really think anything of it. But I guess it got to him. He saw what was going on. In the middle of his message, he told her, get up, or he called her by name, and said, get up and go sit with your mother. I was like, wow! You know. <clears throat> but we, ought, we, we need to be in a place where we allow God to get a hold of us. Um, and when I mean get a hold of us, I mean to be convicting towards us, um, loving, um, just convinced of the gospel, convinced of the truth of Scripture. You know, let it get a hold of you. The second part of, I, did, I didn't have time really to get into the second part, but I, I want to go through this now just to finish up from Sunday. In verse 14 of Philippians 3, again he says, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. You know, there have been several books that I've read concerning the call of God upon your life. When I was a young boy, I remember that time when I was thinking about becoming a Christian. I had a lot of questions. You know, I had a lot of things that I, I thought of. I asked my Sunday school teacher and I never got a clear answer that satisfied me when I had questions. One of my questions and one of my first questions I remember asking was, <clears throat> you know, if sinners go to hell and God knows, you know, and I said, why did God create us anyway? Why did, why did God do all this? Knowing that that which he loved would have to go and spend eternity in hell. But she never could answer it, you know. But as I grew older, I began to learn and understand what the Scripture says. I gained, a, I gained this level of satisfaction of knowing that God has a plan for my life. God has a plan for each life, if we'll just but turn to Him. But this gift, this calling, is one that's beyond even mankind's desire to do or to accomplish. I believe it's in the book of Galatians, the first chapter, first few verses, Paul speaks of, he says, it's not from men or of men, the call. In other words, men don't sit on a council and tell you you're going to preach someday. Or men don't sit on a council or in a meeting or a committee and assign you to do whatever. It's a calling from God. It's a holy calling. It's a calling that's supreme. You know, I, I, and I've heard many men testify that if, if they could be anything else other than a gospel preacher, what would they be? And a lot of them said, I'd, I'd, I'd want to be a Sunday school teacher. You know, just, just, just the call of of breaking the bread of life, explaining it, understanding and, and, and communicating the context of the passage and how that applies to my life today. Of course, written over 2,000 years ago, how does something of antiquity apply to me today in this world? But that's the call. That's the call. Young men across, you know, I've known young men to wrestle, wrestle with that. 
I wrestled with it. You know, I didn't want to do it. The first thing I remember was of, of talking about a call was at Falls Creek. Um, there was a gentleman there, an older gentleman, <clears throat> um, Pete Mays. Many of you may know Pete Mays um, and some other older guys. I don't know why, but it seemed like they singled me out. They would talk to me about things, and one, these guys were Chickasaw guys, you know, I, and I was Creek, you know. But they would talk to me, and they would ask me, what, do you, what does God want you to do? You know, I was nine years old, eight years old. <clears throat> I had no idea. But I knew something that spiritually I wanted to do something for God. I explored different things, you know, missions and summer missionary twice, um, mission trips. Um, but that's, that was where my heart was, reaching out with the gospel. Again, that's the call. In your heart, in your life, the call is different, but it has one goal in mind. And that's the call of what God's Word speaks of, the good news, the gospel. And so what it says here in this passage about that call, it says, therefore, all who are mature should think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. And it says, in any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Nowhere in my, if I have a record in heaven, nowhere in my life have I ever been perfect or close. I failed many times. I was talking to this guy the other day. I, I had spoken to him the, you know, a couple weeks ago when I found his little book of sermons in his, in his car, in our GSA car. And... Uh, he said, do you think it's wrong to preach from that? <clears throat> I said, well, <clears throat> I said, don't let it take the place of your unpreparedness. You ought to be prepared, you know. And I just kind of shared with him how I do things, you know, organization, studies, you know, different things. But I said, don't let that take the place of you being unprepared. And he said, I understand. I said, it's good for notes and things, for illustrations. I said, got a lot of good points in it, you know. I said, but can teach that. I mean, we teach from a quarterly that gives us those things too. I said, but, I said, but again, don't just preach out of that book of sermons as if that's your preparation. And so we talked about different things. And, but again, he says, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained Paul did, not, uh, Paul did not mince words when he was speaking to his family of churches. You'll see in the next few verses, he says, Join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. And then he says, For I have often told you and say again with tears. You see, it, it, it pained him to the point of not, not being disgusted with them, but being just in line with what God expects and what God expects from His people. He says with tears. He focused on that, which is of the gospel. A life that reflected who He was. You know, there have been times I've had to change my demeanor. There have been times I've had to change my attitude about things. One was especially working, starting a new church in Okima. You know, I was set as a Native American Southern Baptist pastor for many years. <clears throat> 
went into the established church, an, an established church. Um, but when we started that church in Okima, we didn't have Baptist people coming to that meeting. We had lost people. We had, uh, we had gay and lesbian people coming to that church and all sorts, homeless people, people that just wanted the food. They just wanted to eat. But nonetheless, we ministered. We did have a few ladies in our church that, were, that went to a, a church. And sometimes they would say, Oh, Brother Randy, do you know who that is? You know, they, they'd say, Oh, they're a couple. A lesbian couple. Should we let them in our church? I said, Sure. Let them stay. But we would, again, just simply preach the truth of the gospel. Never expel them. Say, ah, you're not welcome here. It changed. I had to change my heart, my demeanor. But simply just preach the gospel. But again, he says, For I often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. See, that's where he doesn't mince words. Enemies of the cross of Christ. And what does the cross of Christ represent? What does he say in the Gospels? He says, deny yourself. Take up thy cross and follow me. It's a cross of sacrifice. It's a cross of commitment. It's a cross knowing it's going to be tough to work, tough to do. But he says, you, be, you have become enemies of the cross of Christ. Now this is kind of the, um, this is kind of the, uh, some of the things that were happening. This is kind of like, this is the measure of those who were the enemies of Christ. He says, their end is destruction. You know, they have no further recourse. They have no out. They do this, they follow, they become an enemy of Christ or the cross of Christ. And he says their end is destruction. That's their sentence. That's their destination. As religious as they were, they were far from God. As lawful, Obedient to the Old Testament ways of the law, they were far from being in relationship to God. And so their sentence was destruction. Notice the second thing. He says their God is their stomach. I've had people ask me, does that mean being too fat? Not really. Because it talks about in the, in the, in the Greek translations that talks about uh, the context of it is dietary laws, Jewish dietary laws. You know, they, were so, um, they were so focused on those dietary laws, they would forget the basis of their relationship to God. You know, they were more interested in what was proper and kosher than they were about their relationship to God. Notice the other thing there, it says their glory is in their shame. You know, for a long time I didn't know what that meant. Maybe the shame of their sin or the, maybe the shame of their living as enemies. But when, again, when you read the context of the passage and the context of the book, it's talking about circumcision. In other words, they were more, they were more concerned and proudful of what had taken place during circumcision. That they would show that, if you know what I mean. They would put that out there. Okay, <clears throat> but that's what they—that's what they were speaking of. The, the, the life of circumcision, proudful of that concept. And he says, then then it says they are focused on earthly things. You know, it's not—it's—it's—it's it's, it's hard not to. To be focused on earthly things, you know. concerns, you know, uh, 
um, what's out there. There's a, there's a certain lure of earthly things, you know. And again, when you look at the model that's in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Genesis, I call it the tree account. When you look at Eve and the serpent, the beguiling of the serpent, you see a pattern there. That same pattern is throughout scriptures where men are lured. I was reading the book of Proverbs, and in I think chapter 4, chapter 5, there's, there's an illustration about a, a, an alluring woman, seductive in her ways, you know, draws you to, to that place. And, uh, but it says there, they're, they are focused on earthly things. Again, there's a lure. Re, you know, and, and, and again, there's some, there, there's some measure of reason um, in association with that. Reason rather than faith. Okay. Um, there's probably even the entertaining of truth as archaic truth that's uh, kind of like non-binding to what, what's going on in the world today. You know, a lot of people say, well, that, that doesn't apply today, or that's not contemporary for our times. You know? uh, but again, when you take Scripture, Scripture is truthful. It does not disappoint. In other words, it supports what we believe. And what we believe we ought to practice. He said, they're focused on earthly things. But then he says in the last or last few verses, verse 20, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we, are, we also eagerly wait for, sa for, the sa or for Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body by the power that enables Him to subject everything to Himself. That's the goal. You know. I have never won a prize for being athletic. I'm not that great an athlete. Um, but I can do a lot of things, you know. Um, I've played basketball, football, baseball. Um, I've, I've done a lot of things in life. <clears throat> but individually, I've never won a prize. I've never won a gold medal. I've won the participant medal or ribbon or whatever, you know, as a participant. I've been on teams that have done that, you know, teams that have won, but not, nothing individually. I did at one time when I went to Haskell, I met a goal, I went beyond the goal. <clears throat> But there were only three people there that saw me do it. I didn't get a praise of a lot of people. I didn't get hands, you know, I didn't get a clapping of hands or cheering. I got a shirt. <clears throat> and it said 400 pound club. Weightlifting. You know, I started out lifting just meager weights. My max out weight was, my first time I ever did it was 220 pounds. <clears throat> And I was ashamed, you know. I felt like I was big and strong, but I could only bench press 220 pounds. But by the end of that semester, I maxed out on the last day of class. The football coach was, I can't remember his name. Cleveland Primo, I don't know if you know Cleveland Primo. He was there. And I had another guy, he was a spotter. And that last day, I felt like I was ready. And I maxed out at 415 pounds on the bench press. I was proud. 
but nobody saw me, you know. I had record of it, of that shirt. That was my record, you know, of my achievement. But the scriptures tell us in other parts of uh, scripture that, you know, we're going to be surrounded by multiples of witnesses for the life that we live. We're going to be applauded for what we did for Christ. But yet that, that reward that we receive, as great as it may be and as ultimate as it may become, I'm told in Scripture that we'll simply, because of who Christ is, simply throw the crown at His feet because of who He is. But it says here we are citizens of heaven. We are citizens. Our, our citizenship, the reason we are who we are is because of what God has done for us. The reason for living is simply because of who He is. And ministry involved is simply because of Him. Goals, <clears throat> setting goals or resolutions or whatever, um, are good things. Because again, it helps us to want to achieve, to grow. And we ought to grow. Because again, we are citizens of the heavens. Even though we have to live and suffer and work and everything here, there's a place beyond this that some have recently become an experienced citizen. And one day, we shall too. So as we goal set, as we resolute in our choices, do things that are spiritually engraving. Uh, you see in chapter four of this closing of this closing of this book, he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. He says, if there's any praise, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And then he says, the God of peace will be with you. <clears throat> I'll tell you more later, later on about a conversation I had with a, with a guy at work, but uh, that'll be for another time. I know it's getting late. We've got to practice here a little bit. <clears throat> got four minutes. So. Again, I appreciate each and every one of you. And um, again, I, I, I'm, just, I just, I just, I'm just excited about this new year and all the plans that we have, all the thoughts we have, goals to reach, you know, our food sale, Indian taco sales, getting ready for Falls Creek, yard sales, uh, things that we can do together, revivals, uh, all sorts of things. I'm just excited about that. So let's pray. Um, again, I don't know how many watch. Do you know how many watch on Sunday morning? Does it, does it show any indication of how many? 24? Okay. I'm going to start hitting them up for offering them. No, I'm just kidding. I'll put, put a number. I'll hold a number. Website. But that's good. I'm, I'm glad because I was thinking, well, I hope I got a crowd watching, you know, some days. And I know there's some Alabama guys that watch, too. They, they told me at Falls Creek. So, uh, But um, I really feel like we're in a good place as, as a church. A good place. So let's keep praying. Let me challenge you to pray even more, more deeply. Again, emphasizing a resolution to deepen 
our spiritual walk. Okay. All right. Jeremy, would you dismiss us? together tonight, Lord, in your name, Lord, to give you all the glory. Lord, we thank you for the message, the, the study that we, our, our pastor uh, gave us through. Uh